Welcome to the uh, welcome to the uh, May 2021 uh, virtual open mic here at the Chatham Community Library, and uh, we're going to kick right into it with uh, Eric Sommer here. All right, I'm going to get us started. Oh, sounds like a, a suspended chord you got. You got uh, a uh, dad gad. Dad gad, yeah. Shoes, shoes and socks, shoes get up in the parking lot. Socks and shoes, shake and bake, up in the morning and socks are late, socks are late. Twist and shout, shoes get up and the socks run out. Socks and shoes jump and scream, socks get up and the camp is seen. Shake and bake, shoes get up and it's much too late. Socks and shoes running on out, shoes look out for it's tied and bad. So. Yeah, man. Oh, dead yet, dead yet stuff, you know. <laughs> and uh, so we have that, and then let's do, um, let's do. Uh, Hot afternoon sun bakes the dash as I carry on my last load. Up on the ridge, clouds are breaking, scattering after the shower. Spin this way with a bucket of rain, just getting ready to spill. And the rain most of Tulangwa, getting ready to appear. They hide behind those thunder clouds, waiting till the coast is clear. Can't come out too early, just too fragile to last. When the time is right, they show up so beautiful at last. A 
up on the ridge, clouds are breaking, scattering after the showers. I'm pulling into my camp now, wet cisterns a little higher. Sun is back, big and more. The drops are left glistening below. Dark clouds have moved on. Pushed aside for the show And the rainbows of Tulane were Getting ready to appear They hide behind those thunder clouds Waiting till the coast is clear Can't come out too early Just too fragile to last When the time is right they show up So beautiful at last Or seed me safely home They dance around the cactus When I'm on my own Rainbows of Tulangwa Oh, guide me to my home They're waiting at the back door See me safely home Sun is back, big and bold The drops you left glistening below Dark clouds have moved on Push aside for the show And the rainbows of Tulangwa Get ready to appear They hide behind those thunder clouds Wait till the coast is clear Can't come out too early Just too fragile to last When the time is right they show up So beautiful at last The time is right, they show up so beautiful at last. Oh, thank you guys. Excellent, Eric. Thank you. So, in honor of our good friend, Mr. Brian Biswas, did I say that right? <laughs> Yes, as long, you as did. It, as long as it's your name, you'll take it. Okay. Well, how about, I, another, how about another one? You yeah, another one? I'm going to read you, something. You've got time, Eric. Oh. You can play another one. Oh. Okay. I'm going to read something. If there's time, I'll play another yeah. one. But I mean, this is a make sure this I've just I've been influenced by Brian. <laughs> this is called a song. This is a little short story called The Cigar of Wooden Shoes. 20 feet off the ground, leaning back to get the last touch of pink onto the wall panel. Walmart DeVille was sure it was all over today. The end of the line, the last hurrah for Walmart DeVille, Dutch master, painter extraordinaire. The ladder was teetering. The pink and white buckets were dangerously loose on the top rungs. And the 100-year-old wooden ladder he loved so dearly was structurally unsound at this moment. From that, from where he was perched, 20 feet up, five feet out, the surface of the asphalt parking lot looked hard and unforgiving. Wearing his trademark wooden shoes, lace collar, heavy cloak wasn't helping matters. A close encounter seemed inevitable, and it would probably be fatal if he missed a step and fell. He wouldn't mind being it over, having it being over. He was tired of the zero-sum game of being a 17th century Dutch master soul dropped off, pushed off the bus really, into modern day Elmira, New York by cruel fate. He was an excellent painter, a Dutch master himself. In fact, at 27, he was flat broke, in debt, hounded by his mother's belief that he was a complete failure and simply ready to cash out. The things he loved the most painting in his beloved 17th century Dutch master's style, wearing period dress, wasn't attracting any more portrait commissions or family settings, family sittings. People who took photos, people took their photos to FedEx Ginkos and had them printed onto canvas, fitted into frames. No one wanted to pay for real painting and still few, fewer wanted to be in a room with someone named Walmart DeVille who affected a perfect 17th century Dutch master's style look as a normal way of dress and painted in the Rembrandt von Rijn style of the 1600s. And yes, he was that good. 
He could easily paint anything Rembrandt had painted and then some. Walmart, an unfortunate name his mother had given him after his father had been fired from Walmart, then sued, won, took the money and vanished. Had studied the Dutch masters, Rembrandt, Vermeer, Rubens, and perfected their technique and style, perfected to an uncanny degree of accuracy. Now in complete shame and disgust, he was reduced to this, painting a huge mural for Dunkin' Donuts in their corporate colors on the side of their building in Corning, New York, just up the road on Route 17. It was finally finished as soon as he got off the ladder. This being a Hollywood, uh, a holiday weekend, he had two days of peace coming. The town was almost empty. He would leave the scaffolds up. Sitting on the parking lot curb in the late afternoon sun, brushes cleaned, tarps folded and stowed, Walmart, Walmart DeVille stared at his recent commission, a monstrosity in block letters in ghastly colors, pinky, creamsicle, culotta, and white. He pulled out another cigar from the Dutch master's 50 box he always carried, lit it, and took a few puffs, then glanced at the top of the box as he closed it. It was Rembrandt Van, Van Rijn's a group portrait, syndics of the Draper's Guild, staring back at him. He loved that painting. He looked up at the bare side of the Johnson building that ran at right angles to the Dunkin' Donuts wall. It was clean. It was smoothly finished. He looked back at the five figures on the Dutch master's cigar box. He looked back at the wall, then back at the five figures. On Tuesday morning, as the good citizens of Corning, New York went to work, a small crowd gathered in the Johnson Building parking lot, sipping Dunkin' Donuts coffee and staring, transfixed at the largest, most beautiful painting they or anyone in the Southern tier had ever seen. Cars were stopping, people gathered. Syndics of the Draper's Guild, writ large in breathtaking color and magnificent detail, filled the entire side of the building, glowed like a Baptist window in the glorious morning light. Walmart DeVille is third from the right. He is home. Wow. It's all different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Multi talented. Sorry, we're already in the acoustic thing, so we'll do that. Started off pretty good. I haven't done it in a while. Can you imagine I've been off the road for a year. I'm sorry. I'm 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 losing it. I'll try it again. Oh what a day! What a day I had! What a day! Oh, I, I saw Jesus in the corner of the grocery store floor I said help you help me help me get some more I'm a sinner and a coward and I'm hollow to the core I believe in you if you show me a sign from the floor and all my dreams and all my demons fall get rid of this disease let some happiness fall on me, on me. Oh, what a day, what a day I had, what a day. 
Coming out of the back of the room, he was holding on to a track auto catalog in the gloom. Said St. Peter, can you tell me what can I do to save this crazy world? Thank you, Eric. Thank you guys very Appreciate much. Hey, Eric, I really like that. That song? Yeah, that's terrific. Thank yeah. you very much. That is so kind of you. Uh, I think that's one of my few really truthful and honest tunes. I mean. That's good. Yeah. Brian, are you ready to yeah, reveal I guess. us? I guess. OK. <laughs> Can you everybody hear me OK? I could I could hear I could use a little more of you. You could How's that? Little, yeah, better. That better? <clears throat> Much. Okay, let's go. So I've got two short pieces today. Neither of them have anything to do with science fiction. So I thought I'd do something different. Though this first piece is actually from the astronomer, but there's no science fiction in this. Okay, this first piece could be called. Hey, hey Brian, Brian, is uh, the is the astronomer a collection? The astronomer is a novel. Right. Is it a collection of pieces or? No, it's a novel. And this is an extract. This is called The Nature of Love. Love can be a garden overgrown with weeds, or a garden weeded with care. True love is always of the latter variety. True love demands attention. True love demands time. Not a little here, a little there, but constant nourishment and devotion throughout the years a greater commitment than most of us are willing to make. This is why true love is so rare in the world today. True love's most precious trait is its persistence. True love endures. Nothing can overcome it, subdue it, shackle it, suppress it. Like the petals of a flower, it may be scattered widely by the wind. But when kissed by the lips of God, it will gracefully bloom again. True love is not to be confused with infatuation, which, though true, does not endure. To reach the dizzying heights of romantic bliss, only to be thrown upon the rocks of discord and decay, is a fate not to be taken lightly. 
and yet we spend our lives repeatedly going through such episodes. Like lovesick youths, we wander first to the left, then to the right, seeking the nourishment of love for our impoverished souls. But in our haste, we discover too late, we've misrepresented the problem, misstated the goal. It was not love, but the fulfillment of our own desires that we were after. See that woman, barefoot and alone, under the weeping willow tree. See the tears of molten lead roll softly down her cheeks. Comfort her, and you shall find, deep within her languid eyes, the answers you have long been seeking. Love is a joy, not a burden. It's a cross, a message boldly written on the fabric of creation. Nurture me and ye shall grow. Dismiss me and ye shall perish. Love is all we can affect, but it's also all that matters. And then there's my undying love for you an act of faith in a faithless world. See how I lay myself down in the forest, open my knapsack and pull out the knife, cut open my veins to bleed for you until I die. The end of that piece. More. Uh. Okay. Yeah. The second piece is this will be in my second collection of short stories. I have one collection of short stories that's that's out called A Betrayal and Other Stories. This will be in my second collection of short stories if it ever comes out. And this is called Gwenadine. This is a little bit longer. And this is a complete piece. It's not an extract. Gwenadine. I traveled that day to Gungadir, a small town on the southern coast of France. I was looking for Princess Gwenadine, reportedly the most beautiful woman in all of Europe. She had haunting gray-green eyes, the color of the sea before it storms, and golden brown hair that fell in waves upon her shoulders. Her body was wonderfully proportioned, as if created by a master sculptor out of heavenly stone. She'd had many suitors, but remained unmarried. Tales of her torrid romances traveled up and down the countryside, and more than once news concerning her eminent betrothal was announced, but she'd never wed. Now, it was my duty to arrest Gwenadine on the charge of murder. It seems her suitors were not suitors at all, but innocent victims of a heinous crime. She would win their trust, their love, would promise them her hand in marriage. Then one night after they'd made love and were sleeping peacefully, she'd steal from them all their earthly possessions plant a dagger in their breast and throw their bodies into the sea. It was believed she was responsible for the death of 28 men over the past several years. Gwenadine had been seen only days before, making love to a sailor on the outskirts of Gungadir. Our informant watched in silence as they made love together, as the charms of her lovemaking unfolded. And I, Chief Investigator Rosé Claret, Special Forces Homicide Division, I was to put an end to it all. What my superiors did not know, and what I was not about to tell them, was that I had been in love with Gwenadine once before, madly, passionately, hopelessly in love. 20 years before when I was barely 21. 
We met at the police academy at the Ecole de Criminologie, though I never understood why she'd enrolled. She had no interest in crime or the laws that defined it. Her only interest was in love and the rules that governed it, of which she claimed there were none. I remember one evening when she pulled me into her room with urgent entreaties, her voice, a sultry si siren's wail. Mesmerized by her beauty, drunk with youthful love, I humbly complied. I would have said anything that night to obtain her love. She laughed, for she realized I was bound to her by a magic spell. We made love until dawn, holding each other tightly frantically, as if afraid death itself might come and tear us apart. But death didn't come, not that night, nor the many nights that followed. What separated us in the end, what separates us all in the end, was the simple passing of time. Or that is what I force myself to believe. Gwenadine simply vanished one day without an explanation, leaving not a trace. I received from her only a postcard several weeks later from the Rue de Rivière in Paris. I miss you, Rosé, she wrote, and signed herself, your beloved Gwenadine. But from that day forward, not a word. Her dis disappearance threw me into the blackest depression. What had I done wrong? How had I offended her? There is nothing more terrible than the end of love. Your soul aches. You do not want to go on living. Nor was Gwenadine there for me to question or confront. There was not even the ghost of her presence with which I could do battle. How would I react when I now confronted her? Would I wilt again before her beauty? I didn't know, but as it turned out, I would not discover how, at least not that day. For when I reached Gungadir, I found it empty, a ghost town, no sign of Gwenadine or any other living person. I shook my head. Information was not reliable in this day and age. Informants were not to be believed. Gungadir looked as though it had been abandoned for eons. I'd been lured there by someone for some unknown reason, perhaps Gwenadine herself, intending to try her tricks on me, make love to her former lover amongst these ruins, then off with his head and into the sea. Only she'd had a change of heart. Poor Rosé, today he shall be spared, she sighs. But it had probably been a prank. One of my enemies, a former criminal I had put behind bars, learned of my recent assignment and managed to have me sent on this wild goose chase. And after I spent days looking through the rubble of this decaying town, looking for what? For Gwenadine? for the corpse of our love, and came up empty-handed, everybody would laugh. Perhaps I'd even be demoted. I didn't care. People were always expecting miracles of investigators. Catch the criminals quickly and lock them up forever. A strong wind was blowing in from the sea and a thick fog was descending upon the town, blanketing it with a coat of misty gray. I turned to go. Gwenadine? Murder? Never. She was no more able to murder than I was to dismiss the memory of her love, which I shall never do. Gwenadine, Gwenadine, where are you? In truth, I had looked forward to meeting you again that day, to facing down ghosts from long ago, to putting them to rest forever. Thank you. Wow, that is really good.
I'll let, you, I'll let you figure out which of that is real and which of that is imagined. Kind of, does it change from day to day or is it always the same? <laughs> no, it's up to you. Yeah. Thank you. So, so is that not part of the novel? No, this that's a, just a short story. Yeah. That was great. So much, so much imagery. There's a lot in there. Yeah. I have to stop for a second and go, what is he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> but it was really uh it's uh it's a very rich fabric thank you yeah thank you yeah it feels it feels uh timeless and like a fairy tale but also current you know doesn't it so i guess i'll i'll play us out with with a song today um okay so this song so car uh, currently is called apologies Probably will always be called apologies. It goes like this. Take out the silverware All over the floor And I can't get around in my bare feet anymore I had some ideas I don't know where they are This is a cocoon And I was gonna turn into something better Pretty soon That ain't what happened I guess you know You ain't gonna crack the wall If there's no place you wanna go It's all right in the morning, it gets dark in the afternoon. Hang on to your voicemail, I hang up at the tone. I want to be a stammering voice leaking out of your phone. y'all is it is a nice tight little group today see you guys thank you very much yeah and we'll see you we'll see you in a month guys thanks yep. for showing up thank, thank you, you. Thanks,